Hi, my name is Michelle, and I have with me today Marcus Redman. Marcus is an actor, screenwriter, director, and producer, and you probably recognize him from Doogie Hauser as Raymond. He played that role for three years from 90 to 93, and I just want to say hi, and thank you for doing this with me. Absolutely. I'm looking forward to it. This is going to be a lot of fun. And yes, it is. And I just have to say, um, you know, only one thing about the Doogie thing is that I read Neil Patrick Harris's um, autobiography that it came out earlier this year. And he talked about how crazy it was. Like, did your life go from calm to crazy like his did very quickly? Uh, I'm sure his became a lot crazier than, than mine. Uh, but I, you know, I was in high school and I had auditioned for the show, and it was funny. I auditioned for the show before that role, uh, and I think that's how I got the role. Mm -hmm. uh, they had me come in uh, to play one of Doogie's friends. He was doing a thermal party during the first season. Um, and I, I grew up in Pilsera County, and all my friends were circles. And, uh, as you can see, I don't <laughs> um, so when I when I did the audition, I read it like surfer. Ah, uh, yeah. Nice. And so it became. Uh, so then we had me for um, thug. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, hey, where, where's that? Where's that? Where's that black guy that sounded like a surfer? Let's get him. <laughs> <laughs> and. Uh, and then that's and that's how I did it. It was always supposed to be that one that one piece. Uh, and then Steve Macho came down to the set and said, "I don't know where they found you, but I'm glad they did." And then the rest was history. So I just kind of came out of high school and walked into this whole thing where I'm suddenly on this television show, uh, and mostly it was just bragging rights to people in high school and making fun of me. Wow, that must have been a very cool feeling to have Stephen Bochco like you when you're 19. So it was, uh, but I didn't know who he was. I hadn't met him. That was probably better. Set. So it was weird because I knew it was a closed set, and there was just this dude walking around on set. So I kind of had an attitude. <laughs> because <laughs> you're like, who's that dude? I'm supposed to be there. Like, I know I'm supposed to be here. Right. Who are you? What are you doing here? So and then and then and I met I met him. Well, that's that's awesome. And like I said, I remember, you know, I remember it very clearly because that was my I was in my 20s when that late 20s when that and I watched it. I was, you know, serious mm -hmm. fan. So like I said, I recognized you right away. I'm like, right. I remember you. That's awesome. But um, yeah. I have to put it out there. You were also in Fight Club. Oh, yes. Fight Club. That's Fight Club. That's and actually, it's weird. I get recognized more for that. than for you. you did what? I get recognized more. Really, for that role. I recognized you right away. I mean, I, I rewatched it yesterday. I hadn't seen it, you know, it was out in 99. I hadn't seen it in a while. And um, I forgot how crazy that movie is. But. <laughs> so cool. It's one of those things, it's like this iconic film. So it's like, as an actor, you don't care. Like, I mean, I don't, it doesn't, I could have, I could have said like one line in the whole thing and it would have been worth it because it would be a part of like Right. Right. So, no, you had a great you had a great role. I think that was a great role. <laughs> about Fight Club. If you're watching Fight Club in the opening credits, uh, after they come out of Edward Norton's head and the gun that's in his mouth, that's my gun. Very cool. Because that's the gun that he took from me. That's pretty cool. Edward Norton, I mean, you know, you had to wrestle him to the ground. You know, you kind of had to wrestle him down. So, you know. <laughs> I'm sure it wasn't much of a fight, though, because, you know, <laughs> you could just pick yeah. him up over your head, you know? So. <laughs> that was a lot of fun. That was, that was a lot. Edward was, he really wanted to get beat up. Like, he wanted to be the antithesis of what Brad Pitt was. So, he, you know, Fincher would come in the room and he would say, listen, I'm to really flex your forearm because I'm just slam his leg against the thing. And, you know, Video Village was like maybe two rooms away. So David would come, set the stage, and leave. So I would tell Edward, I was like, listen, um, 
Dana's going to do this thing to your leg. So maybe you want to kind of give it a bounce or something because I don't want to. He's like, no, 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 no. Which is my leg just really. All right. Dude, that's fine. He's just, he's just right. one of those intense actors that really wants to, you yeah. know. He just wanted to go for it. So I was like, all right, if you really want it to hurt. <laughs> <laughs> all right i can do it but you know <laughs> yeah. but i was yeah. you know for anyone who um doesn't know you did a video on on um, youtube a very long one with film courage and what i what i did find out from there is that you had written you you know you wanted to write your own screenplay and then you wrote it in like three weeks yeah. you sold it and yeah. i can't here's the thing i can't find it so can you tell us like where to find i would die for you I don't know. I I don't know. I mean, I would I would assume it's somewhere in the annals of Sony. Somewhere. Yeah. So it's like uh, they have to, you know. I looked on Amazon, Netflix, you know, anywhere I could find. And well, you know, it, this was before they started putting scripts out for public consumption. Mm. You know, like right. This was, what year was that? What year was it? We sold. It. Oh my God, I'm about to say something I never thought I'd say in reference to myself. It is <laughs> at the turn of the century. The turn of How's the century. that? Yes, me? that's awesome. So, uh, wow, you were young. You were young. Yeah, yeah. I was, what happened was I was just sort of in this place as, a, as an actor. I was very frustrated because um, I'm a guy who grew up watching Woody Allen movies and, and old movies from the 30s and the 40s. Yes. Uh, and I looked like this and I got all of them. <laughs> So, uh, like, you know, rooms and casting directors have absolutely no idea what to do. Like, it doesn't, it doesn't make any sense. When I'm, when I'm in the room and I'm reading for Thug Number Four, who kills cops and eats babies, and I'm talking about Frank Sinatra, uh, it, it, it confuses people. Right. So, I thought rather, you know, what's the word? Naive, naively. Mm-hmm. I'll just write a script, and then I'll sell it, and then I'll understand how business works better. That was literally my thought process. Going That's out. crazy. Which is um, good, because you were young, you were naive, you just yeah. did it, and you didn't, you know. There was no sort of fear. It was just like, okay, this is what I need to do. So I wrote the thing, and then Sony bought it, uh, and then we worked on it, and then they bought another one shortly after that. But again, it was, it was before anything... Became, it was before anybody thought anything about you know, Did it? I just wanted to know if it's the same title. I thought, well, maybe they changed the title of it, but it is that title. Okay. No, it's the same title. What happened there was a director who had come on board. But here's the other thing. This is, oh, this is a good story. So this is another thing writers should know. Okay. Uh, especially when you're new. Uh, you come in, you sell a script, they get very, very excited. They give you notes, you do the notes well. They get very, very excited. And then they tell you, Really, really excitedly, you're fired. Uh, this is a good thing. Okay, I, so so what happens is if you're new and you come in and you write something really, really well, it's to the point where the studio is starting to think about, hey, maybe we should make this thing. Uh, that's a good thing for your career, but most likely they'll fire you off of the thing and they'll bring in another writer who's more established and has done more stuff. Mm -hmm. It's like their version of an insurance. Company. It's like when someone's trying to finance a film and the, the story is great and the characters are wonderful, uh, but they won't sign on to anything until you go get a huge name to come be in the film. It's mm -hmm. their version of an insurance policy. So it's and like they, your name doesn't get up there? Is that what you're saying? No, it does. Oh, See, okay. that's, that's another thing. That's, that's arbitration. Oh, okay. Uh, so what happens is they bring, in, uh, they bring in a new writer, not because they don't like what you've done, because they want to ensure, they want to make the, the investors, they want to make the executives. The oh, okay, okay. That this person can deliver the script, that we can actually shoot a script that A-list stars will sign on to. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's, a, it's a seniority type of thing. And then what happens is, uh, if the script changes more than 51%, that's when credits start to get jumbled. Mm. Okay, so... Um, the, the question that I think all screenwriters would have is like, so you, you get paid right yes. up front, right? Yes. You're going to get paid for the script, whether you stay on or not. Yes. Okay. They pay you to go away. They pay you to go away. Well, they that isn't you. such a bad idea. <laughs> they, 
give you an upfront check. Uh, usually your contract is as long or longer than your script. Mm -hmm. It's ridiculous. Uh, they come in, you sit down with them, they tell you how awesome you are. And how That's good. I like that. And they tell you everything wrong with you. Uh, <laughs> and then you sit in the room with like, you know, anywhere from like five to ten executives. And they all have conflicting ideas about what is going to make the script better. And then it's your job to sort of sort through all of that stuff and please everybody. No pressure. No pressure. No pressure. I, I, you know, I've heard from different people that, um, you know, screenwriters that say, like, especially like getting attached to it. You know, once you sell it, yeah. like, just let it go. Go write another screenplay. Don't don't think it's the be all end all of you know, and it's going to change the world. And you know, just let them. You know, you do your thing. Let them do their thing. And that's, that's <laughs> the thing. When I when I had written it and I took it to my manager at the time. And this is this is another interesting thing too because uh, I know that there were some folks who saw the film Courage videos and uh, were sort of like, well, you know. Okay, yeah, he sold his first script, but you know, he was like on the show and he had connections and then um, it doesn't work. It's not true. No. I mean it's you did not. say I mean I think that when you said in that video that um, you know, you knew somebody and right away I was like, Well, that makes it easier knowing so because you did know somebody, you know. Yeah. I knew a comic who was friends with a literary manager. Hmm. That's why I didn't know anybody at Sony. I didn't okay. know anybody. Right, but you know, I do. I believe that things are also meant to be. You know, what ha what connections or connections or connection. You know, whoever it is, all, if it's meant yeah. to be. You know, all connections are great. And yeah. but the thing is, you know, this guy. Because here's the thing about connections. This is what I think people um, who haven't kind of been in the game a bit don't quite understand. And 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 there's no way they would. Mm -hmm. uh, connections are good, but nobody is going to put their business in jeopardy because of a connection. Mm. Right. 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 Like if you, it's like if somebody comes to you, if you, if somebody you love or a relative comes to you and says, "Hey, um, I want to buy this car. Will you co-sign for me?" and they already owe you like ten thousand right. dollars, you're not going to be like, "Oh, I love you here." This is fine. No. But if it's a responsible person right. and you know they have a track record and you can trust them, right. then it becomes a different thing. So my comic friend sent me to his friend and I sat with the guy and he says to me, well, what's the script? So I told him the story and then I said, listen, I don't care because at the time I had no intention of being a writer. I just wanted to be an actor. Right. I was like, I don't care what they want. If they want it to be pigs on the moon, I'll make it pigs on the moon. I just want to sell it. So he read it, and he thought it was good. He gave me some notes, and then we went from there. And from there, it was the regular sort of channel. The manager sending it out to mm -hmm. different and producer, a producer got on board, Channing Dungey, who is now the president of ABC. She was the very first... Uh, so they came on board the piece and said, I dig this, and she gave notes. And then after I got through with her set of notes, she sent it out, uh, what do they call it, preemptively to uh, Columbia. Mm -hmm. It's at Carrie Richmond, who's no longer there. Uh, and she read it, and she's like, before you hit the town, I want to take it off the mark. And that's how we ended up selling it. So, you know, it wasn't like, it wasn't like I called Stephen Bochco. I was like, hey, I want to sell the script, man. And Steve's like, all right, we call some people. It wasn't, like, it wasn't like that at all. It wasn't quite that easy, right? Yeah, it wasn't. It, you know, it wasn't. It wasn't like that. It was. It, it really. It was about the script. It was. It was about. Well, you know, when you read screenwriting books, it's oh, they're always so like doom and gloom, like about oh. you know, like. Oh my God, you could write one, but don't ever think because when you go into an office, they have them up to here. Nobody wants to read them. Nobody. I'm like, why are people going to school for this if nobody wants to read them? Like, why? <laughs> well, I think, see, this is my problem with those books. I think there's truth in that. I mean, you can you will go into offices and you will see scripts piled all the way up to the ceiling. And 
in an, in an industry that operates off of written material, no one wants to read anything. All of that is true. But I think the reason why they sort of sell that song and dance to folks is because what it does is it sets up the author or the book or the seminar or the program or whatever to be the only way to make it happen. Right. Like you I can tell you the this. magic formula to right. writing a screenplay. You know, then exactly. you get another book and they're like, throw all the formulas away. Don't do any formula. And you're like, oh my God, I thought I had the formula. <laughs> right. I thought I had the formula. No, none of those formulas are right. The new formula is no formula, and I'm the only one that can tell it to you. Give me $10,000, and I will give you the career of your dreams. None of that is true. Like, none of that works. That right. doesn't, doesn't happen. What I do uh, as a writer now, as a filmmaker now, is I compartmentalize. I have a very definitive sort of checklist. And if I come up with a story and I go, okay, this is something that's really fun and cool and I dig it, um, but but it could sell in the marketplace, okay, I'll put that over here. And then I have another checklist of stuff. And if I really love it and I feel like if I write this or once it's written, it's not done, I'm not finished, mm -hmm. then that's something I've got to hold on to. That's something mm -hmm. I've got to direct. And that goes over here. Mm -hmm. Over here, this pile, it's like, I don't, I don't, I don't care what they do. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I know what I like. I know what I do. But a business is a business. So, yeah, sure, whatever. Yeah. I mean, if you guys want to know what my opinion is going into the rewrite, I'll give it to you. Mm -hmm. But ultimately, if you guys are going to pay me and you want me to turn it into, you know, pigs in space, sure, fine. Because I got this stuff over here. So I think... For me as a writer, it's important for me to understand and know the difference between what I'm looking to do as a filmmaker, mm -hmm. I want that voice to be, um, and, and what I can put out into the marketplace. Yeah, because I was going to say, like, as an actor um, writing, like, when you sell it, aren't you like, but I want to be in it? Or you're like... That's, well, yeah, that's you how know? I started. Because you're like, I well, off. I wrote a part for me, and it's awesome, so put me in. <laughs> <laughs> well, see, that's the thing. Like, you know, I, I when I wrote the first script, I did that. And the problem with that is, is unless, you know, you're an A-list person, uh, and you write a really great role, there's an A-list person that's going to want that role. You know, and Woody Allen still, writes himself in there, everyone, you know. See, 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 <laughs> there you go. Now we're talking about that was right. last century, okay? Yeah. And it, it's just about compartmentalizing. So what I do now, if I'm writing something and I see that it's going to be a marketplace thing, I don't even consider myself a part. Mm. So you can distance yourself. When you're writing it, you just put yourself right out of yeah. it. And... It's over. and a lot of times it's really easy. I just have to, you know, I just got to make the character a, a white guy. And then I go, <laughs> you know, over here. <laughs> <laughs> and about writing something for me, then I keep it. You know what I mean? Like I, I keep it. I hold on to it. It's there's a different, uh, there's a different pathway, right? For the things that I'm looking to do. And then the other things are just sure go. I yeah. You Which is kind of why you do do your own. I mean, you act in yeah. your own. You do do your own, and you have one coming out, right? Yeah, yeah. We and have uh, the 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 six degree. Six degree. Sort of, uh, my sort of modern noir psychological thriller thing that we sold. Uh, my producers took it to camp. Um, is it a full that. length or is it a short? No, it's a full length. Oh. Shorts. I I respect shorts. Um, a lot of people do them. It's a great way to you know test your metal. Uh, I've done a short myself. Mm -hmm. uh, but in this day and age, you can make a feature for the amount of money that you can make a short. Hmm. And I say, for me, if you can do it, if you're going to make a short, make a whole movie. Right. Just make a whole movie. It's going to show people, it's going to give people a better sense of what you can really do. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I mean, listen, some folks have Again, with the connection thing. Some people are connected to different things. Some people have better outlets for things. You know, Damien Chazelle, he did a short for uh, Whiplash when you couldn't sell La La Land. Mm. You know, 
and then he was able, because of his connections and his management, he, uh, J.K. Simmons, I think I'm saying that right, who played the teacher in Whiplash, mm-hmm. was in the show. and then he got the feature, retained that guy, he got Miles Teller, and then J.K. Mm-hmm. won the Oscar. And wow. then after that, people were like, okay, well, what would you like to do now, Damien? And Damien was like, remember that La La Land I talked about the first time? <laughs> I want to do that. And everybody went, okay, you get, you know, it's, so I get the, the And concept. now it's up for a, didn't it just get nominated? Yeah, for a Golden Globe. For La La Land. Oh, mm-hmm. La La Land, it's, the, it's the, apparently it's the greatest film ever made in the history of ever. I, I didn't see it, so I, you know. I, I haven't seen it yet. It looks amazing. It looks amazing. But I mean, it's clean house. Like everybody on the planet, even critics, or like everybody seems to love this. Thing. I know. I have to have this, like mental note to go see it, but oh my god, I'm totally looking. It's right in my alley. It's like a classic musical done now. I mean, oh, that's my wheelhouse. Very cool. Uh, you know, but I think that's the thing. You know, you, right? You, you, when you can do that, it, it's great. But I think most folks that are starting out don't necessarily have the ability to get that short in the right place. Right. You can make a feature. It's just it's a finished it's a finished sellable project. That's the key. I think that I think in feature. Like I think I don't know that I my brain could stop at twenty minutes. You know, mm-hmm. like you know I would. I, but that's just from you know watching movies. Shorts. Right. Are, I mean, shorts are good for YouTube, and like you said, anybody can make them. So it is kind of cool that they have that outlet, but. Um, I was talking to um, a screenwriting professor a couple weeks ago, and I asked him. I had just seen, I had just seen Doctor Strange and Allied, and I said to him, "What do you tell your students that now? You know, like you have Doctor Strange, which was what's that going to cost? A hundred million dollars at least to make, and you know, the very little dialogue, very, you know, it's all special effects." And and um, he said something pretty interesting. He said that he actually tells them about television now because there are over 400 TV series being shot right now because of Netflix, Amazon, you know, do you ever think that way? Do you ever think, I mean, you've been in TV. Um, How hard is that to write as opposed to a a movie? I, I think it just comes down to the story you want to tell. I mean, you know, I, I enjoy both. In fact, it's weird because I sort of have this commitment and reputation to work now. Um, but I, I watch way more television than I watch now. It's more accessible, you know? It's more accessible. Uh, I like I like the, the idea. It's more, it's, it's, it's a fan experience for me, mm-hmm. more so than a film is. Um, and maybe that's because I'm more concentrated in film myself. I can just sort of lose myself in watching a television show or binging something. You know what I mean? Um, well, you can sit down on a weekend, Netflix, weekend, binge watch a TV show. Right. Just you know? watch it and get lost in it and not have to. I mean, if I see a film, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm analyzing it. I'm looking at it. I'm mm. studying it. It's like I'm in school when I'm watching <laughs> I get that, but I get that way now, too. I really do. I go to a movie and I'm like, Okay, and I start looking for things, you know, right. looking for, yeah. do- like Doctor Strange, I definitely looked for, you know, different things, and, and Allied then broke every, did you see Allied? I haven't seen Allied. Oh, well, broke every screenwriting rule that I've ever, you know, heard of, of and and it, and, it, and you walk out of there, and you and you can argue with the person you went with how what the ending was. Like, it's one right. of those open-ended, you know, and which drives me insane. But then again, that's why people like it, I guess, because they can, like, argue all the way home. <laughs> that's, well, that's the thing. I mean, that's why, that's, you know, I was interviewed about The Sixth Degree, and I and I, I have, I have a twist ending there. And I said, I want people to argue about what they think is the ending. And then I want them to go out and get some pie. And then I want them to go see the movie again so that they can prove their point. Interesting. So, yeah, absolutely. Argue, argue, argue. Like, yeah, uh, yeah, you're totally right. You're totally so, right. Yeah. Oh, no. You're. <laughs> See it again. Uh, but I think with television, you know, it, it's still, I personally think television's harder. I would think it's accent. harder. I would think, I'm, but I'm not a, I've never seen, you know, I've never seen a script for a TV show, and you have, but it does seem like it's a very hard, to, to make it continuous or not continue, even if you wrap it up, even if you do like an, an 
YPD Blue, and it wraps up uh, at the end. But then to have an interest in, and it's got to continue, but then not continue. You know? Do you mean in terms of uh, you mean in terms of writing one, or in terms yeah. of getting into the business of one? Well, I I just think to have a TV show like that's that successful you got to make the right. characters continuous but the storylines have to wrap up in 40 minutes every you know right and i which i guess is why they have teams right don't they usually have teams for tv oh yeah you definitely you definitely for the most part i mean some some mavericks out there will do like their own hbo series and they'll write all 10 episodes of it and that's it but will smith said something that i think makes a lot of sense with regards to television and film uh he said when he was doing the fresh prince of bel-air when you walk the streets in New York, uh, people would go, oh, hey, hey, Will, hey, Will. And then when you started doing films and you walk the streets in New York, people would approach you and say, hey, Mr. Smith. Uh, and I think that really tells the difference between the two. Television, you're in, you, these are your friends. You know you what I mean? see them every these, week. Yeah, they're like, they're, they're acquaintances, they're friends, you invite them into your home. So it's, it's, it's a more character focused or should be a more character focused scenario not that film isn't mm -hmm. but I think that in films you can present you know a very sort of extraordinary situation along with relatable characters and people will go on that journey whereas if you don't have compelling characters in television no one's going to care you know, like, why, why do you, it's like your friends, like, like, why do you go have, like, coffee or brunch with people all the time? It's because right. you like what they have to say or what they're into or what they do. Right. You, there, there's learned behaviors that are appealing to you, and that's mm -hmm. why you hang out with those people. It's that, that's, that's the key with television. You, you, you learn who they are, and then you like them for that. And I think... A lot of times when showrunners leave and new showrunners come in and they don't honor those behaviors, that's when people stop watching. Yeah, and it, um, you know, I don't know if this is so much now as much as it was back, you know, dating myself. But, you know, take a show like Friends where they were so successful, but then all they wanted to do was be movie stars, like break out. Like I can break out of a TV show and be a movie star or, you know, and, and but it's then they, when they go the other way, and I'm talking as a viewer. It's like, oh, why are they doing TV when they've made all these great movies? But, you know, like, it, it just is interesting that that's the way, like, as a viewer that we thought, you know, the way that we think about it. But I think it's kind of now with Netflix, like I said, with the original series. And I don't know that it's so much that way anymore for an actor, you know. No, it's, it's the whole, every, it doesn't matter anymore. Yeah, I just think that they. Unless you're like Tom. Hanks or Cruz or right, they or, show up on a TV series and you're like, mm. yeah, that's a weird thing. <laughs> but I mean, even we 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 just had John Travolta on uh, People vs. OJ Simpson, right? So you know, Nicole Kidman is doing a uh, HBO series with him, right? Series. And that's what I'm saying. Like, don't you think now? I think I think that was more what it was 80s, 90s. You know, yeah. but now it's like it's media so out there. Everything is so out there that just right. to be on anything. They don't even care anymore. They just want to be on the stuff they care about. And, you know. No, it's, it's become much more centered on numbers. Um, so whatever whatever, whatever brings the numbers in, mm -hmm. you're involved in that thing. That's not. And, and actors, even, you know, the most well-known ones, they, they just want to work. Everybody right. seems to work. And they know. want to do what they care about. Right, exactly. What and they care about. They right. love. They want to do what they're into. And, and, and and with film, you know, I mean, I this whole superhero thing is I I understand it, I get it. I yeah, because it. well, I have young boys, okay, now right now I, in the teenage years, and they like that's what they're that's what they go to. If I say like a movie like Allied, you know, a little bit more, you know, story driven dialogue, you know, they're like, mm. right. all right, well, you yeah. go see Doctor Strange? Yes, I want to go see Doctor. Right. <laughs> I mean, that's the thing. They want the problem is, um, you know, we're still human beings, and you can't get away anymore. Like the Michael Bay days of filmmaking are done. Mm -hmm. You can't just blow stuff up and call it a movie anymore. You know, these movies like Doctor Strange did really, really well. Did you see it? Uh, no, I don't watch those. Okay. 
the weirdest yeah. thing about Doctor Strange is that this is where I I did it in 3D, okay, and it wow. was virtual. I'm not I'm kidding. I'm not kidding because I see all these movies, but I have never like I had to take the glasses off. I'm like, oh my god, I'm on top of this freaking building and I can't, you know, <laughs> and and that's right. where you know that stuff. I mean, like you you can't just blow things up. No, you're they want to be there on because everything's virtual now, and I've never seen a full. You know, it was like a ride. It was right. crazy, crazy. Well, that's what they really, that's what they really, really actually want. I mean, when these big studios, they make these huge things for two, three, four hundred million dollars. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's cool if you go see the movie, but what they really want you to do is go buy the stuff. You know what I mean? Um, that's, that's totally true, want. right. They right, the marketing, the, the marketing. Yeah, end it's, of it's, it. it's, it's, it's buy everything. So if the movie gets you to buy all the stuff, great. Um, and little and kids are I, dressing yeah. up as, you know, or something. Yeah, you know? like all of the, the, the costumes and the cosplay. Yeah. And all that. Like, go buy the stuff, and we're happy about it. And so we'll make all this stuff. Because they're all trying to make, they're all, they're trying to make billions of dollars with these things. Right. And, and they're not, they're, they're, they're not batting a hundred with them, you know? And you can't keep making films. For five hundred million dollars, because you got to remember, any film that costs from a hundred million or up, an additional equal amount is spent on marketing. Mm-hmm. So, if a movie costs a hundred million dollars, it costs two hundred million dollars. You know what I mean? So, and then you come out, and you got to make all that money back, and then you got to make a profit off of it. You know, it happens sometimes. Like it's going to happen without the strain. But there's a lot of them that they make for that amount. It doesn't happen. So eventually, <laughs> you know, this this is it, it's cyclical. This is this this happens. I, I, I do believe that because I wouldn't want to see Doctor Strange on TV, like on Netflix. Right. You know, well, that's you know, it's, you know, <laughs> it's just it, takes something out of whatever it. Whatever reason, they they love to sort of find ways to like expand, make tons and tons of money. Mm-hmm. Uh, and when that happens, story a lot gets lost. But then the industry implodes, like it did in the 40s and the 50s. It just, it just went away. And then what happens is the only special effect that you can pay for is story. And then you suddenly have these new filmmakers come up, and this is how we got John Cassavetes and you know, all these wonderful filmmakers from the 60s, mm-hmm. you know, who had very little money, but they had something to say. Right. And I think that's the thing that's missing a lot with a lot of filmmakers now. You know, everybody's just trying to do these big, splashy stories, but there's very few filmmakers with a voice that are actually trying to say something. Yeah, and I, you know, I'm with you, because I walk out of there going, what, what was the point of, you know, of that? Yeah. Really? You know, it was, it was yeah. typical, you know? But before right. we go, I want to ask you, because you said you're a Woody Allen's fan. You love yeah. Woody Allen movies. Which Same. is your favorite one? Well, Manhattan, the one he hates, is the one I love. You know what my <laughs> favorite one is? Yeah. Match Point. Match Point. Oh, gosh. <laughs> so, and some years. That is... One I can watch best that movie and most unexpected over things. and over and find something different and and I have to say that that's I was always you know a fan but that movie I was like that man is a freaking genius he is because there is it's right. layered in so many you know different things it's you know I love it it's one of my favorite now here now, now go with me here a little bit with me now uh, okay so match point right right think back nineteen eighty nine. A little film called Crimes and Misdemeanors. Mm-hmm. Essentially, same thing happened in Crimes and Misdemeanors. Hmm. Right? Right. So, and Al's got a great family life. He's got the mistress. The mistress gets mad. She's going to tell the wife. He calls his brother. <laughs> yeah. he, gets and he gets away with it. Right. 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 The very last scene of the film, Landau and Alan sitting together. Woody Allen playing a filmmaker, Landau says, what do you think of this for a story? Tells him the story. Isn't that pretty close to match point? Mm -hmm. So my theory is, these are how things are connected. To me, match point is the guy from Crimes and Misdemeanors 
making a film that Landau's character told him about. Ah, uh, interesting. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Because it's a very, it's a similar, it's a similar kind of deal. And uh, that's, that's how, that's how deeply embedded and wacko I am. In, in <laughs> but that's cool. I mean, at least you can, you know, you know movies well enough that you can do that, you know? Some, some, his, some. His. <laughs> You know, <laughs> I couldn't do it for everybody. So. Right, right. But that's cool. So, okay, so you have this movie coming out. When is it going to the festival? When is that happening? Oh, well, it's the, we're not, it's not a festival so much uh, because we've already sold it. The distributors. Oh, are, okay. I don't, yeah, I didn't understand the, so you yeah. sell it and then they. Well, what the goal now is what they're doing is they're taking it uh, internationally. So they took it to uh, AFM. Um, they took it to IMP Cancun, uh, they took it to the Dubai International Film Festival, and what they're doing is they're setting up pre-sales internationally uh, for the digital rollout of the film. Okay, so when, when do you know when yeah. anybody can, you have no idea. No. Do you show up at those things? Like, do they ask you to be there? No. No. No, because they're, at this point, it's different from like a Sundance type of thing. Or right, that kind of thing. right, that's what I was thinking, right. Yeah, because when you do those types of things, a lot of time, if you're not a big studio film, you know, you're there to sort of present the film. You're showcasing, you're trying to get someone to buy it. Mm -hmm. Since we've already been bought, the company, Adler and Associates, they're just basically going around the world saying, here, here's our movie. We want to sell it to this territory for this much. So they're basically selling it around the world so that we can end up with our digital rollout for the film. Oh, that's pretty cool. It's a cool thing because we're kind of ahead of the curve here, right? But it's it's a little less glamorous because you know there's no big red carpet, right? You know, I, yeah, exactly. Because you kind of miss out on that, but you know. Yeah. But, but okay, so what what are you writing next? What's ah? What am I writing next? Uh, <laughs> uh, I have a piece uh, that I'm working on called Flower Child, um, which is uh, about a. Uh, an adult film star who quits the business and goes back home so that she can make amends with her mother and her teenage daughter. Um, oh, I like it. The problem is the town discovers what she used to do, uh, and it forces a wedge between her and her family, and it reveals a secret about her family that's hmm. pretty awful. And could end up destroying not the family but the entire town. So, you know, feel good. That's that's intense. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, oh my god, that's you know, I'm sure you'll, I'm sure it'll, it'll all come back. Like, so bad, right? <laughs> and yeah. um, and then we talked about. I mean, you're you're now going into the script consulting business. You want to yeah, I just I, 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 and. I, so many people were so kind um, uh, and wanted to know what I thought about things. And I just, I never, I never, you know, I don't even watch movies when I'm writing because I don't want to even subconsciously yes. take something. And, yes. So I don't want to do that to people. But, you know, I spoke with some folks and they explained what release forms mean to me. And, um, I, I decided I, I will start helping people because I think um, I think I can offer something that all of these other sort of seminars and courses and stuff don't mm -hmm. in the sense that I think what most writers need is the courage to actually trust and believe in their own voice mm -hmm. and I don't think that these seminars do that I mean you know coverage and interns and readers and all of this stuff, all of these people, they are, they're trained to say no. Mm -hmm. They have a checklist that they got to go down. And that checklist is how they say no. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's so many scripts out there and no one wants to read. And you've got 10 to 15 pages to actually make somebody interested in your script. And if they don't get interested in that period of time, they toss it aside and they start off on the next one. Right. And so it's like it's it's boring. It's a checklist. I get it. If I if I if, if, if a studio executive that I work for sends me home with thirty scripts for the week, <laughs> right? You're like, 
Okay, oh, well, I want to do yeah, other stop, things. Stop, stop, stop. Yeah, totally. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm not going to say or read all this crap. You know what I mean? <laughs> I want to play Battlefield or whatever. You know, right. I don't want to, you know. Right. So I get that. But I think for writers, I think, I think you do have to sort of like release all of those rules. And you have to really just fall in love with the craft and the process of writing a script and, and, and the story that you're telling because that's what will come across. You know what I mean? Right. And I think that if you can be encouraging because, you know, like I said, just writing one, finishing one, you know, from, from to page 110 is, you know, if you can finish it and you can, and then you can give them really great advice on instead of saying, forget it, it's over. Write another one, you know, like I love right. when people say in books, you know, well, don't think about selling a script till your fifth one, just like what you said, you know, and you're like, wait a minute, I sold my first, one. you know, well, don't, don't think about getting out of there without a hundred edits. And you're like, well, I only made two edits. I don't know. <laughs> Doesn't matter. It's it, it, these absolute strike me nuts. I'll tell you a story without telling any, without giving away any names. I, okay. I was working on a piece mm -hmm. and, uh, I was given notes. I did the notes. Now, the, I was given a fraction of time, six weeks, mm -hmm. in which to do these notes, to complete these notes. And I did them in like five days. And I turned the script back. And the people in question read it and were like, this, no, oh my God, no, no, no. <laughs> you didn't try it all. This is terrible. Oh my God. Just red lines all over the place. So I go home and I look back over the thing and I'm like, I don't. I disagree. I think I hit all of the things. I, I feel good about it. I don't disagree. So a friend of mine said to me, you did it too fast. They don't think you took it seriously because you did it too fast. I said, so what am I supposed to do? They want you to sweat. To, it's like, <laughs> like being Mike, like I'm, I'm like, if I'm Michael Jordan, I'm not supposed to dunk. I'm supposed to like, <laughs> right? Like what am I supposed to? So I said, all right, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to test this theory. So I opened up my PlayStation and I spent the next five weeks playing PlayStation. I didn't touch the script. And I delivered the same script back mm -hmm. at the end of the six week period. Oh, perfect. This is exactly what we're looking for. So this is exactly the <laughs> Right. I don't even know how to cap that off. I mean that's you know what I mean? Yeah, exactly. Gotta believe in what you're writing. You got to believe in what you're doing. You know what I'm saying? Yes. And yeah, there's a game to play. Like I had to learn if I, if, you know, if I would have just played. TV doing this. Week, oh, yeah, I played video games a week longer. Right. It would have been great. I would never had to do the thing. But you know, everybody's got their things. Each company has its own personality. You learn that stuff, but ultimately, you got to be able to believe in your own stuff. And, and I'd like to help people get to that point. Because and I, I do, do, I think now, now more than ever, more people have, like you said, you got YouTube, you got every, you have, you have connections upon connections anywhere you look, you can get, you know, who knows, who knows what happens to it. it you never right. know. So I like to go on the, you never know. And I, and I don't want to be doom and gloom about, you know, that nobody can make it, you know, it's like anybody, no, if you want to do it, you can, sure. you can do it. And if it's going to happen, it'll happen. And, you know, but it's, maybe it's, something else will happen. And then that's good too. Like, you know, no, it's, I never thought I'd need directing anything, but I love it. It's, it's, it's great because, you know, as the writer, you know, you did everything wrong. Right. Right. No one knows, no one has any solutions for you, right. but they got all the problems that you created and you got to right. fix them. Right. As the director, you're just right about everything. <laughs> and, you know, think about it as the director, right? Like by the time the director shows up to the project, script's done. It's already gone through rewrites. Right. And there's like this team of people that basically give you like multiple choice questions. Right. And you go, uh, well, how about this one? And they go, brilliant. <laughs> and just go do what you want. So I'm like, what am I busting my ass for a director? I'll just be the director. And that way I'm right. Right. You have like an, you walk in into the set and you're like, I have an instant fan club. They're all just sitting right. around. You know? Exactly. They don't even want the writer on the set. Like, right. what do you do? Oh, I wrote the script. Oh, right. uh, I, I got, I, I see somebody over here. It's like, <laughs> it's like, no, 
for sex. So I'm like, you know what? Screw it. I'll be the director. And then that way, you know, I can protect things that I really care about. That's why, like I said, this pile over here, I right? have that pile. This pile I can do what they want with. But this one over here, I, I keep to direct because I want to protect that stuff. Right. I saw a video with James Patterson, you know, the novelist. And he sold one of his novels as a movie and they invited him one day. I mean, he just wrote the novel, but they invited him to the set one day and they added characters and took away characters. And he walked up to the writer and was like, I didn't even, you know, what's going on here? And they're like, who are you again? And he's like, I'm James. Pa like if James Patterson can't get any respect on a set, you know, like, That's true. <laughs> you know, they don't care. They don't care. Right. They're like, yeah, well, your book didn't work. Oh, well, it sold a hundred million copies. Yeah, that wasn't working for them. <laughs> <laughs> See, that's the thing. I think, you know, people purport themselves to, to understand. Mm -hmm. And the thing is, there's a lot of inner workings that can be learned and understood. That's true. Um, but in terms of what works, nobody knows. Right. Nobody knows. There's absolutely no reason in the world that La La Land shouldn't even have been sold. Right. Let alone shocked. You know? They told him to get the hell out when he showed up with it. Right. Now it's out, and he stuck by it, and he protected it, and people are loving it. People want, and it's because he loves it. You know what I mean? People want to feel that stuff, but right. they're not going to feel it if you don't feel it. Right. If it's not, if you're looking for a money grab, people are going to smell that a mile away, and you're not going to get their money. And I think that's what happens with a lot of these superhero movies. Mm -hmm. The money grabs. Right. You know? Yeah, oh, for sure. For sure. You know, and, and you can almost tell, like, with them, too, is, like, they get one um, lead actor, like Benedict Cumberbatch, mm -hmm. and then that's it. You know why that's it? Because they can't afford to get a whole cast of people. Because they can afford one because of everything else that's going on, so it's not cast heavy is what I want. Right. But... I don't know. I, as a movie watcher, like back in you know back in the old days, like Audrey Hepburn, like look at the cast. You would be like, it's the it's the, 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 the high society. You know, you had Bing Crosby, right. like Frank Sinatra. You, you know, it's like now you with those kind of movies, they only have one. They get one because they can't right. get a whole cast like that right. for those. So you it's, know, it's a difficult it's a difficult proposition. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's just different, and you know, I think you're right. I think it's it's a phase, and you know. Well, you know, if you look at the look at the way we judge actors now, um, <laughs> if it, if if Dustin Hoffman and Jack Nicholson came along now, they never work. Right? They would never work. A young Dustin Hoffman, can you see him on the CW? It would never happen. <laughs> they would never cast him. You know That's kind of I mean? funny to think about, though. You know, because you're so right. Because they liked actor. I mean, he was an actor. He wasn't, right. you know, he wasn't a, um, you know, he wasn't Brad Pitt. Even right. though Brad Pitt is a great actor. I'm not trying to, but you know what I mean? Like, he wasn't, he wasn't but, that, you know? You know, not for nothing, Brad Pitt's a great actor now. Mm -hmm. True. Right? Yes. I mean, back in the day, he was just like the guy that gave Thelma or Louise or whichever one of them her first orgasm and he's walking around with no shirt on. <laughs> And I was like, oh, my God, he's so, so – he's just hot. Okay, right. he, fine. He, he, I don't so, even think he had, any line, he had, like, barely had two lines in that movie. It didn't matter. Nobody cared. <laughs> and it made a star. You know what I mean? Yes. So it's like, okay, that's fine. That's how it works. But there are people that are doing incredible work, and they're not seen. They're not showcased. And I think that's what's so great about how digital distribution has sort of taken off. Yes. And, Yes. The power of the internet and the power of independent film because at least there's a place for those people to find each other and, and to prosper. And, yeah. and then you get like those gems that come out of that world, like, like yes. Mark Eagles. Yes. Without independent film, who, we would never never know who Mark Eagles is. Right. Ever. You right. know what I mean? Yeah. So I do. I have a tendency to go towards that. I mean, because I do love seeing the people that come out of that. You know, I yeah. love the independent, you know, movies, but. Cool. Anyway, well, it's been so much fun talking to you. I've learned so much, and um, I will put notes uh, for your screenwriting, uh, for your script yeah. consulting, yeah. Uh, for anybody that wants to contact you with that. And I hope that we get to see when this comes out. Like, I hope we get, you know, 
You let everybody yes. give everybody a heads up on on something. Well, definitely, definitely keep you posted. We we were smearing to sell the film as a Rothkop, mm-hmm. so it wasn't finished when we sold it. So now, while our distributor is selling the film, we're at home completing the film. Oh, awesome! So we're working to finish it. We're hoping to have it done by the new year. Uh, and and once that's set up, we've got everything squared away internationally. We ought to know when. Uh, when folks will be able to actually see it. Right, and you're you're kind of like one of those well-adjusted child stars, see? <laughs> <laughs> Probably because I wasn't really a child star. I, was yeah, I know, but nobody, I didn't know you were 19 then, so, you know, it like came across <laughs> as well-adjusted, so I'm really happy for you. I'm happy for everything you've been able to accomplish, and, um, you, you know, much. keep it up. So we'll talk to you soon. Thank you. Okay, thank uh, you. Yeah, bye. Yeah.